Hello and welcome everyone to this Refugee Studies Centre panel on the use of new technologies in immigration and asylum governance um, and examining their implications for human rights. If you don't know me already, my name is Catherine Costello. I'm currently a full professor of Global Refugee and Migration Law at University College Dublin, but formerly of the Refugee Studies Centre. And this is one of the events that the centre is organising to mark its 40th anniversary. Uh, the last time I convened one, I wished the RSC welcome to the wonders of middle age, but realized by Oxford standards, 40 years is a blink of an eye. So, uh, But it's nonetheless the oldest refugee study center in the world. And these are events showcasing some of the research at the refugee study center and challenges facing refugees and the global refugee regime generally. So we have a great panel today. I'm going to introduce them very briefly so I don't take up too much of the time. Um, and then each of us will showcase some of their research and uh, some of the implications of the use of new technologies in this field. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Daria Ozkul, who's a senior research fellow at the Refugee Studies Center, and she's a co-investigator on a project called AFAR, which stands for Algorithmic Fairness for Asylum Seekers and Refugees, that's funded by the Volkswagen Foundation, and which I'm also involved in. And she's going to be presenting a report which she researched and wrote on mapping the use of new technologies across Europe. Our second speaker then is Professor Lorna McGregor, who is Professor of International Human Rights Law at the Law School in the University of Essex, where she leads a research project called Human Rights, Big Data and Technology. Uh, she recently co-authored a report with our third speaker, Dr. Petra Molnar, on digital border governance, a human rights, rights based approach, which was undertaken in partnership with the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And her forthcoming book entitled Detention and its Alternatives under International Law, which is coming out later this year, addresses the use of new and emerging technologies in decisions to detain as well as alternatives to detention. So it's great to have Lorna with us also. And our third speaker is Dr. Petra Molnar, who is a faculty associate at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center and associate director of the Refugee Law Lab at York University. Her research combines legal analysis with ethnography to highlight the impacts of border surveillance on people on the move. And her wonderfully titled book is forthcoming next year, um, and it's called The Walls Have Eyes, and we're all greatly looking forward to that. So Daria, I'll hand over to you directly, and then um, and we'll get the panel going. And we will have Q&A uh, towards the end for those of you in our audience, um, but you'll use the Q&A function um, on the webinar in order to pose any questions. So feel free to get typing as any questions occur to you during the presentations. Thanks. Hey, I'll just put on my slides, just bear with me. Um, and I hope you can, oops, sorry. So I hope you can see, see the slides and hear me fine. Uh, so hello everyone, and thank you very much, Catherine, for the introduction. So today I'd like to introduce you um, to the AFAR project, which is a consortium uh, led by also Catherine Costello, uh, which I am also one of the co-investigators. And in this talk, I will provide an overview of the primary findings from the initial phase of our research, which involved a mapping of the various uses of new technologies being adopted or being piloted and currently under development by immigration and asylum authorities. So I should note that this research primarily focuses on the practices in Europe, um, but the broader talk today um, by Lorna and Petra and hopefully in the Q&A, we'll also go through uh, more global practices as well. So to outline the structure of this talk, I, as I mentioned, I will first introduce you to the AFAR project and then briefly explain the methods that I have used in this research in order to investigate the purposes and the scope of these technologies. So the first set of technologies that potential migrants are subjected to, well, potentially subjected to, starts with predictive analytics, which is a tool that is used to, or that claims that to, uh, used to understand future migration and displacement patterns. So this category also includes um, surveillance technologies such as drones and sensor cameras used in border regions to deter or um, push back potential arrivals. The second category includes technologies that are implemented in immigration, 
um, basically to process immigration applications. And the last one, the last category includes technologies that are used in asylum, either in asylum decision-making or the broader asylum support system. So given our time constraints today, I will primarily focus on the last two categories, basically the technologies that are employed in immigration and asylum by the state authorities. So within the AFAR project, we are primarily interested in understanding to what extent existing fairness standards uh, apply to the new use of new technologies. And our approach to understanding fairness is quite interdisciplinary. We have a team of legal scholars who examine procedural fairness standards. We also have social scientists, um, political scientists and sociologists like myself, uh, who investigate how fairness then is perceived by the broader public and by migrants and including asylum seekers. So in the first step of our project, which I took the lead on last year, um, we did a comprehensive mapping of all types of new technologies. And this initial step helped us to understand the current landscape and practices within this quite uh, rapidly evolving field. And then it helped our team also to conduct more in-depth analyses through specific case studies. So for the methods, for the mapping uh, research, uh, for this research in particular, I used multiple methods, primarily because there is very little, often little information, if not none sometimes, regarding whether or not and what kind of new technologies state authorities are using to process the applications that they receive. So I started with an online questionnaire targeting practitioners and experts in this field and followed up with interview requests with uh, immigration authorities across Europe, and in one Dutch case, also the police as well. And I joined another journalist from Algorithm Watch and the European Parliament member to initiate um, inquiries on specific tools. I also submitted a number of um, freedom of information requests to the UK Home Office and the Immigration and Asylum Authority in Germany, um, which is BAMF regarding the details of some of the identified practices. So to begin with, um, with the practices in the immigration field, we can see that there have already been some experimental implementations and pilots for using the so-called AI-based document verification technologies. Most of these are still under development and some countries are using them, <clears throat> basically to scan through documents and to see whether or not there are any fake ones. There have also been some controversial EU-funded research projects that tested behavior and emotion recognition, um, which basically have tested applications to detect the so-called uh, possible fraud or lies among travelers and stop those whose behaviors are not found to be credible. So these projects were never implemented. They were only tested, but obviously they sparked huge criticism from civil society organizations such as um, Protect Not Survey Coalition members and also academics working in this field, especially in um, social sciences. But perhaps the biggest change in the processing of immigration applications has arisen from the European Union's um, drive towards interoperability. So I won't go into too much detail in this talk, but just to summarize, originally the EU information systems were built to operate independently. So for a long time, for example, the Schengen visa applications required manual processing with officers manually cross-checking applicants' data against existing information systems, such as Schengen information system. But with the establishment of new information systems and the broader interoperability framework, which you can see in the picture below, most applications checks will now be done automatically against various EU and international databases. And that means that human intervention will only be required when these automated checks produce hits, uh, which will then require a manual assessment. And the same logic of automation also extends to the processing of the um, forthcoming travel authorizations within the ETIAS system. So going forward, going looking at the future, um, the EU agency, which is responsible for the operational management of large scale IT systems in this area, EU LISA has indicated that in the future, it will be possible to use machine learning um, to deal with the so-called suspicious applications and support case workers uh, with their risk assessments. So currently the uh, new information systems are still under development, but once they fully function, and if machine learning is used, 
it will be very important for us to critically analyze how these technologies will be used and to what extent they may result in unfair situations or outcomes for applicants, particularly when considering the potential for um, mach machine glitches and data quality issues which already exist and historical instances of unfair treatment which may then feed into new decisions. So these automated system and systems and risk assessments have the potential to reshape the dynamics of mobility as we understand it today. If machine learning is used in this area, they may result in speedier responses for certain applicants, while others could find themselves flagged with more waiting times and or rejections. Looking at the practices at the more uh, national, at the state level, um, so at the state level, we are already um, witnessing the use of automated systems in various capacities. So, for example, in Norway, uh, the processing of citizenship applications has been made completely automated if the final outcome is positive. If it is negative, then a caseworker reviews the application. Also, both Norway and to some extent Sweden employ rule-based systems for processing some of the visa applications that they receive. Within this space, there are also the more contentious um, triage systems, as they are called, that basically categorize applications based on predefined risk or complexity levels. So these systems can potentially lead to unfair treatment, particularly affecting those perceived as having higher risks than others. So for instance, the UK's visa um, application processing once employed a triage system that classified certain nationalities as riskier, meaning that subjecting them to higher levels of scrutiny. And this practice existed for a number of years, hidden from public knowledge, until two civil society organizations wanted to take the Home Office to the court and ultimately leading to the revision of this practice. A similar risk assessment system is used for marriage registrations in the UK, where those who receive residency rights due to a marriage or civil partnership are categorized according to a set of risk criteria. So those perceived to have higher risks of having sham marriages, as it is called, as it is called undergo more scrutiny by the Home Office. So really a critical issue with these practices lies in the lack of transparency because applicants are not aware how their applications are being assessed. They're not aware of the specific details of the risk or complexity criteria that they have been subjected to. And that really leaves them with little limited agency to understand and challenge the decision-making systems if they need to. In the asylum field, um, there are, there's currently no such automated processing of decision-making um, but there are a number of technologies that are used for evidence gathering that help with decision making. So these technologies include, for example, automated uh, name transliteration, uh, dialect recognition, mobile phone uh, data extraction, and then analysis. So the, th the three of them exist in Germany. They're currently used in Germany, but the mobile phone data extraction is also used in other countries as well. And he, really, the, here, the, um, the aim is really to facilitate the country of origin assessments, so to understand whether the, where the person is coming from, and also credibility assessments, whether or not the person is telling the truth regarding uh, their travel route and where they come from. And in the report, I go into the details of these technologies, including the involvement of various private companies, the legal foundations supporting their use and the extent to which state authorities use them and possible implications for um, asylum applicants. So in terms of the implications of using these automated evidence gathering tools, it's, I guess it's important to note that the introduction of these technologies also potentially changes the power dynamics within the asylum process. So we can see that with new sources of information put against applicants, there's also an increased burden of proof imposed on them. So when decision makers, for example, try to interpret the results of these tools, the generated um, reports that the tools issue them, any technical glitches, errors, or inconsistencies become points that asylum seekers must address and substantiate. In the asylum field, we also see uh, the integration of new technologies to accelerate the asylum processing workflow. So, for example, one example is the automation of interview transcription, which has been tested in Italy with using speech to text technology. In the Netherlands, we also observe the development of a case matcher system that helps case workers 
and identify similar cases from the past. In uh, Norway, we see various tools that are used to streamline the distribution of welfare benefits and the allocation of reception centers for asylum seekers. And finally, there are several pilot programs which are exploring solutions for matching settlement locations for asylum seekers and refugees. Um, so trying to choose and match them to a location within a country. So really, um, I mean, we can obviously see that there's a growing interest from state authorities to explore or to start using new technologies to manage migration and asylum and process applications as fast as they can. And the mapping report gives a lot more in-depth information about each of these practices that I mentioned in this talk, but also more which I couldn't go into details. And throughout the report, I argue against a, a totalizing, a black and white analysis of these technologies. So in each case study, we need to analyze first the context, looking at the actors that are involved, the pressures from different sources, and how these tools have been legitimized, designed, and implemented in practice. So in other words, we need to understand each case study on its own to analyze the implications, but also, of course, analyzing them within the broader uh, trends towards digitalization in immigration and asylum. But there are some uh, common issues that I would like to conclude this talk. First of all, the question of transparency. So without transparency, applicants cannot uh, be aware, uh, let alone understand, uh, what technologies that are they are being subjected to and how they work and resist the outcomes uh, that they receive if they want to. The question of accountability is also crucial. So who becomes responsible when there are glitches and technical mistakes, especially if these mistakes and how they come about are not available even to even decision makers themselves. But more importantly, rather than just focusing on transparency and accountability, we also we should start our thinking by analyzing the fundamental workings of immigration and asylum systems and the related unfairness questions related to them. Only then can we assess how the integration of technologies might further transform these dynamics. So I will finish up here. You can access the full report on our project's website, also on the RSC website for more in-depth information. And if you're interested in any of the further details, please feel free to email me, uh, get in touch with me via email. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Daria, for that super clear um, and insightful overview and setting up some of the general issues of concern so nicely for our next two speakers to pick up. Uh, so I'll hand over directly then to Lorna, to Professor McGregor, over to you. Um, thank you so much. I'm not sure if I'm frozen a bit in the video somehow. No, looks good. No? Okay. Um, so thank you so much um, to Daria, Catherine and Annalise for the invitation to participate in this event. I'm especially delighted um, to be able to participate in the launch of the groundbreaking report as one of the first outputs of that AFAR project. Um, this is because, as, as was mentioned, Petra and I recently published a report together with the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights on digital border governance, a human rights based approach. And in the preparation of that report, we greatly benefited from from it, um, as well as Daria's participation in meetings and careful reviews of our study. So we're very grateful um, for the chance to engage with this further. There's so many important findings in this report, each of which merits a really close and detailed discussion. However, in the time that we have today, um, I wanted to offer three reflections on the report and how we might move um, forward in this space. So the first point that I really wanted to highlight um, is the structure of the report. And that might sound like an unusual place to start, but in organizing the use of digital technologies temporally um, or by location, so looking at the use of these technologies before, at and after the physical border, the report really helps us understand that border governance and therefore digital border governance is much wider and pervasive than acts that happen at physical borders. 
And we also tried to make this point in our study by emphasizing that technologies are introduced into an expansion of border governance through both internalization and externalization of the border. And I think that once we understand that as an analytical frame for understanding um, the use of these technologies, um, we start to see that this is the context into which they're being introduced, including through a political economy, which is driving their uptake. And we'll start to really understand why they might be sought, um, particularly by state actors and different um, private actors that are encouraging their, their use. And then we start to see the extent of the damage that they can entail, um, particularly from, as, as Daria just pointed out, from a power base perspective um, and challenges in terms of identifying and challenging the use of these technologies. So I think that that was a really important way in which the report has been structured um, and a key takeaway, I think, for us understanding um, the cumulative effect of the use of these technologies and how they span both time and space. The second point that I wanted to highlight um, is the detail and the depth of the report um, on the specific uses of new and emerging digital technologies. And that's something that is a really a key takeaway from the report as well. Um, it looks so thoroughly at specific examples um, with a lot of specificity. And at the end, it really emphasizes the need to look at specific technologies in depth. Um, and in this space, uncovering and making visible the concrete types of technologies being used in border governance is incredibly difficult. Um, and it's incredibly difficult due to the opacity of the space generally, and the challenges in using existing research methodologies, such as Freedom of Information Act requests, as Daria mentioned, to actually get more information um, on the use of these technologies. Um, and until we have a much greater commitment, and as our study recommends, a requirement of transparency by states and by private actors on what they're using and why they're using it, um, and also what kind of technologies they're considering introducing, reports like this are absolutely central to pooling together what can be known as well as emphasizing what we don't know about the use of these technologies and their deployment already um, in this space. So I think that that was a really key contribution um, of this mapping report. And I think another really important finding is that many of these technologies are currently designed to benefit state agencies rather than people on the move. Um, who have very little possibility to, to input into, shape and challenge the use of these technologies, as Daria has already mentioned. And so while there may be many possibilities for technology to advance the human rights of people on the move, we see that this focus on their design to benefit state agencies, as highlighted in the report, um, very much restrains these possibilities. So the second point is that reports like these with the precision and depth that they have are absolutely pivotal for having some basis to pursue better and more human rights compliant governance of these technologies against so much opacity, um, which of course can lead to deniability. And the third point that I wanted to make is that I think when you read reports like this one, you realize how little we know but even with the little that we do know, how much harm can come from the use of many digital border technologies, particularly in an environment such as border governance, in which human rights are not only underprotected, but which in some instances border policies may be explicitly in opposition to human rights through policies of exclusion and discrimination. So when we were writing our report, what we took away from reports like this one and many other groundbreaking reports written by civil society organizations and academics is that we have to get to a place where these technologies are not introduced until very strong human rights compliant governance frameworks are in place. And that, of course, first means that we need to have a strong 
human rights governance framework to border governance generally. We have to see that states' existing obligations and private actors' existing human rights responsibilities are respected and are implemented. Um, and then in our study, we recommended a major shift away from after the fact discovery and analysis of digital border technologies to try to focus on much more meaningful and transparent public and participatory assessments of proposals to introduce border technologies before they are deployed. Um, and this would include scrutiny of proposals to introduce these technologies prior to any steps being put in place to develop, procure or accept trials, in adverted commas, from private actors. And that where technologies pass such a phase, they're subject to really rigorous um, ongoing due diligence processes aimed at identifying and mitigating any human rights risks. However, even in such contexts, we are of the view that we have to have the possibilities of bans on the table for technologies which pose really serious risks or inherently conflict with human rights, either by design or in their operation or implementation. And ideally, these bans would happen before technologies are ruled out. But as this report that is being launched today shows, many are already in circulation and have been deployed. And so a key action point for us moving forward is to see a stock taking exercise of these existing technologies um, and for states to really look closely to assess their compatibility with human rights law and where they're not compatible to stop their use um, and to take them off the table. Um, so thank you so much again, and congratulations on this report, which has been so important um, for the discourse in this area. Uh, thank you so much, Lorna, for those very uh, generous and obviously well-deserved words of praise and uh, acknowledging the contribution of the report and also uh, your insights from your own work. And really this call for effectively, you know, a stock taking and possible embargo, I think is a really powerful one and one I think we're going to discuss more in the, in the discussion afterwards. Um, but right now I'll hand over to you, Petra. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thanks to all of you for, for tuning in to this important webinar. Indeed, just to reiterate what uh, Lorna said about the AFAR report written by Daria and colleagues, it's such an important contribution to the field because as one of the main concerns in this area is just even knowledge around what is happening across different borders. And, you know, I've been really lucky and privileged uh, as someone who's been doing work in this space since about 2018. It's been it's been interesting to see this kind of rise of interest in this topic, but also it really shows the gaps uh, in terms of even just knowing what what is happening across different contexts. So reports that are doing this really deep contextual mapping, um, such as Daria's, are very, very important to lay the groundwork so that we have as full of an understanding as possible to then be able to say what are actually the impacts of this technology. And that's really what I want to focus on uh, with you today in my brief remarks to really bring it back to the ground, so to speak, and, and really tease apart some of the ways that these applications are impacting real people. Um, because sometimes it can seem so um, kind of up there uh, talking about projects that are difficult to see, difficult to investigate, and even difficult to analyze. But really what my team and I have been seeing across a variety of borders um, is that these technologies already have impacts on people's human rights and on their lives. Um, I've been I've been really lucky being able to compare uh, some case studies uh, and seeing firsthand how this is playing out along fringes of Europe, the US-Mexico border, um, the occupied Palestinian territories, and the Kenya-Somali border, for example. And of course, all of these contexts are very different but they speak to this growing panopticon of unregulated technologies that both Daria's report, our report with the OACHR and, and all the other great work that's being done in the space are concerned about. Um, and again, you know, I think it's, it's, it's very easy to talk in abstract terms, but these spaces are spaces already of discrimination and violence and real people are impacted by the rollout of unregulated and high-risk technological experiments. 
um, many of which are explored in, in the report um, and include, of course, also other experimental um, projects that I just want to briefly highlight to give it a little bit more of a global, global scale. One, one particular area I want to just briefly focus on to, to move us away from just the European territory is looking at what's happening, for example, at the U.S.-Mexico border, which has already been, of course, a site of discrimination and violence um, for, for decades, if not centuries. But what we are seeing is that this already opaque discretionary space is being sharpened through the use of different technologies such as fixed integrated uh, AI surveillance cameras and towers like this that sweep the Sonora Desert and create this surveillance dragnet that is uh, impacting people, but also more and more experimental projects. And this was a very surreal moment uh, for, for me when I, was, when I was there in the Sonora, the Department of Homeland Security announced that in addition to some of these more um, kind of typical surveillance projects, they were planning to roll out these so-called robo-dogs to patrol um, the U.S.-Mexico corridor. But again, you know, it's it's easy to get caught in the kind of almost sci-fi uh, visceral nature of these technologies. And there's something particularly disturbing about the lack of public conversation around these projects. But I want to bring it back again to the people because we're not just talking about technology. We're talking about real impacts. For example, in this corridor, thousands of people have already perished making this dangerous crossing. Like Mr. Alvarado, who was a young husband and father from Central America, we visited his memorial site after hours of trekking through the Sonora Desert. And unfortunately, Mr. Alvarado, who was in search of a better life, succumbed mere kilometers from a major highway. And I think it's important to, to pay respect to, to stories like this, because governments often say that surveillance and smart borders are somehow a more gentler way to um, focus on border governance or, or to deter people from, from making dangerous crossings. But the data does not bear out. What happens is that people are not deterred. Instead, people have been forced to change their routes towards less inhabited terrain, leading to loss of life not only at the US-Mexico border, of course, but along the fringes of Europe as well. And what's particularly disturbing is as we're seeing this rise of these unregulated high-risk technological experiments in the not so distant future, will people like Mr. Alvarado be pursued by high-speed military-grade technology like RoboDogs? I always just also like to include this photo as a great reminder of the kind of artificiality of borders. This is, of course, the infamous border wall that bisects US-Mexico along the El Camino del Diablo, the Devil's Highway that you see there. And it's this juggernaut of infrastructure that is also, of course, supplemented by surveillance technology, but it also just ends and you can kind of climb this hill and pop your head over to the other side. It's always very important to remember that borders are, of course, very real, but they are social constructs that we play into as well. And then I know this photo is very difficult to look at, but I always like to include it because it, again, literally brings us to the ground. This is from the uh, Greek-Turkey border um, in the region of Evros, which has been a major crossing point for people who are entering European territory. And this is a small village um, that lies in a really beautiful place. Um, and it's the final resting place of, of people on the move who have perished making the journey. And when I was there, I was I was really moved by the acts of care from the local imam in the village who was taking care of uh, this village, uh, this the cemetery. And while paying respects, um, something caught my eye, and it was these three holes that were crudely kind of chewed out of the earth. Three open graves waiting. So this is the region where experimental new surveillance technology is playing out. And as as the FR report goes into, and as our report with the OACHR also explores. We're talking about, again, a growing panopticon of surveillance technology, of, um, you know, different kind of aerostat machines, even uh, long range acoustic devices or sound cannons that have been ex experimented with at this very border. And of course, there's also this kind of rise of carceral technology um, that Lorna in particular is an expert in, but talking about, you know, the rise of these high tech refugee camps that have been piloted along the Greece-Turkey border, but of course also um, taken up elsewhere. But how do real people actually feel about this? Um, I spent some time uh, on various Greek islands over the years, speaking with people who were facing forcible transfers into these camps. And this young mom 
hurriedly typed out this message to us when we were there. And she says, if we go there, we will go crazy. And it's hard, it's not hard to, to understand why when you actually see what these camps look like, right? We're talking about the kind of unfortunately traditional infrastructure of containment supplemented by biometrics, aerial surveillance that's extending the border into the sky, predictive analytics, again, that are pushing people into dangerous terrain, all exacerbating the vast human rights impacts that we, I think we are all concerned about with on this panel. But it's also about broader questions, right? And, and this is kind of where I want to, to leave you with. We're talking about questions of participation as well. Who gets to determine and decide what we imagine is possible as we innovate in, in today's world? What even counts as innovation and why do we prioritize certain projects over others? We could be using new technologies, for example, to root out racism at the border instead of using AI lie detectors to test them out on travelers. Or why are we using robo dogs when we could be increasing access to justice or psycho psychosocial supports at the border? These are all choices that are made by very powerful entities such as states and the private sector that are concerned about border enforcement, often at the expense of people's human rights. And if I had to sum up kind of the corpus of my general uh, you know, work in this area, it would be precisely this. The lack of global governance that we are currently seeing and this kind of lack of regulation around border technologies is no accident. It is deliberate because it allows for the border to be a laboratory, a testing ground for unregulated high-risk technologies that we would really be uh, up in arms about if they were happening elsewhere. However, that is also changing. And for example, the New York City Police Department in this spring of 2023 announced that RoboDogs are once again going to be deployed to quote unquote, keep New York City safe. One is even painted like a Dalmatian. So these technologies are not just inherent to the border. They are also bleeding out from spaces like that. And that's why we really need to be concerned about what this is doing to people and people's human rights. Now, normally I would end there, but I just want to take one more minute to perhaps on a slight, end on a slightly more positive note, um, because it can get very bleak and very depressing when we start looking at issues like this. Participatory methodologies and really centering people's lived experience of migration are, I think, one of the central ways that we can shift some of the conversations that we need to be having, both around border governance generally and how it's being sharpened through the use of technology. And we run this small project called the Migration and Technology Monitor, which is an archive and a platform and a community that is trying to really make space and give resources to people who are mobile, who are on the move, to tell their own stories and do their own research on work uh, at the intersection of technology and migration. And we started a fellowship program this year, which we are uh, doing another round of next year, which is great, um, funding five people from Venezuela, Mexico, Syria, Nepal, and Uganda, looking at all sorts of different projects, both on the surveillance side, but also how new technologies can actually empower migrant communities and look at both sides of the way that technology is changing the migration space. Because I think participation and in seeding space and looking at who actual experts are, people with lived experience must be in the driver's seat of, of all these conversations. Because that is really the only way that we're going to move the dial and bring back the human impacts of what we are really concerned about with today. So thank you so much. And thank you to Daria and Catherine and your team for inviting Lauren and I to join you on this panel today. It's really wonderful to see all these reports and all this corpus of work in conversation with one another as we kind of grow our understanding of, of what really is happening in this kind of increasingly digitized world. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Petra. Um, that was really useful reminder of the impacts of border surveillance and border controls and also the role that technology plays here. Um, I should say when we were, or, or when Daria nerd, nudged me to think about this area, I think your original report, Bots at the Gate, another great title on the use of automated decision making in Canadian practices was one of the few ones out there. And we really, you know, when I when we decided that a mapping would be a necessary first step to do a European focus project, um, I'm not sure we realized how challenging it would be, but also that, you know, that we really don't know. And that was certainly the feeling in 2018 when we were citing your first report. 